The Invisible Arc is a concept championed by Reptile Keepers without ever having read it. I set out to read it and I was shocked. To me, this book is brilliant yet horrifically flawed. And to explain to you why, I'd like to introduce something that I call the spectrum of morality. At one end of the spectrum, there is utilitarian views. This means the ends justify the means. On the other end of the spectrum, there is deontological views. This means nothing justifies something that is believed to be morally or ethically wrong. Both ends of the spectrum are the two extremes. I believe most people, like myself, are somewhere in the middle. Now the reason that I believe that this book is flawed is because this book is extremely utilitarian, to the point of I think it's at the very very end of the spectrum. But more on that later. The Invisible Arc is defined by the authors as the unseen collective result of private ownership of animals, particularly the cultivation of captive bred populations. The authors state that the wild world is dying, and even least concerned species will soon become endangered, so captive populations are paramount. It leads heavily on how commercialization has saved many species. Examples of this include the success stories of crested geckos, the Pierre David's deer, oryx being farmed by Texan ranchers, and even the farming of animal byproducts that in turn offset the pressures on wild populations, and how collectively the Invisible Ark can, and will maintain, a greater number of species diversity into the future, all without government funding due to the commercial nature of the situation and the individual investment of the keeper, whether that is for profit or for pleasure. The most poignant point that I found in the book was about the amphibian extinction crisis. If you did not know, the world's amphibian populations have reached a critical mass extinction level crisis. Globally, zoos, universities and conservation organisations are currently only best prepared to manage 10% of the endangered species of amphibians on Earth. The point being made by the authors is that the invisible ark could house breed and finance any number of amphibian species, its potential is theoretically limitless. Now this is the raw power the Invisible Art concept possesses, and it rings true. This part of the Invisible Art concept is a shining example of what herpticulture can and should be if we best manage ourselves into the future. What is good for a species is not necessarily what is good for an individual of that species. No individual animal wants to die, but sometimes it is necessary for the good of the species. The zebra being eaten by the lion does not want lion duty, but if the zebra population was not kept in check by predation, it would overbreed and overgraze, till there's no food left and the entire population crashes, and all would die. The author states that many budgies die at the hands of inexperienced first-time owners. The individual budgie doesn't want newbie duty, just like the individual zebra doesn't want lion duty. But the author's unwritten rule means that the species as a whole benefits from the invisible arc of captive budgies. For every 100 sacrificial budgies, one keeper that cut their teeth on this entry level species may go on to be a master bird keeper, who may go on to do valuable work with rarer species and more species and build the invisible arc. In the author's view, the ends justify the means of the invisible arc and this is an extremely utilitarian viewpoint. The authors talk about how modern society is disconnected from death and many do not understand it. That people are not only disconnected from death, they want to cover it up in niceties, legislate it and even ban it. The authors go on to say that death is a part of what defines being alive. Nothing dies of old age in the wild. They say the only way to prevent death in captivity is to ban captivity altogether, because everything dies. So basically it doesn't matter how and when something dies in captivity, because everything dies anyway. An example of this would be with Bearded Dragons. This is Beardy Bit, otherwise known as Dr. Jonathan Howard. He's one of, if not the leading expert on Bearded Dragons in the world, and he's spent years studying Bearded Dragons in the wild. Here's what he has to say about Bearded Dragon survival rates in the wild. 98.4% of babies die within the first year in the wild. 
So 98% of bearded dragons die within their first year. What about the ones that do survive? Most of the males we're looking at are two-year-old, three-year-old. Males only live to about three and a half years old and they've reached their life expectancy and they die. So if 98% of wild baby bearded dragons die within their first year, and of those that do survive only live a few years, compare that to bearded dragons living up to 20 years in some cases in captivity. Well that's a theoretical 700% increase in lifespan in captivity compared to the wild. So even if 98% of captive bearded dragons would theoretically die at the hands of inexperienced first time owners, one could assume the majority that do not are outliving their wild counterparts significantly. So this viewpoint of death and mortality rates in captivity expressed by the authors in this book is very utilitarian, but it does offer food for thought with this particular species. I would personally look at it as a case by case basis. Now when these authors were working in zoos some 30 years ago. They were taught a saying and that saying is they only know what we tell them. They make the point that keeping is an experience based endeavour. Animal people share a culture that is founded on the experiences of those keepers from before, all combined to create a foundation of knowledge, a database, a history. They say that zoos buckled under animal rights pressure and changed their cages from previously successful setups for breeding to quote unquote naturalistic cages in a bid to appease antis. They say granted upgrading enclosures did benefit individual animals, it did not benefit animal species. So the authors acknowledge that more complex enclosures benefits animal welfare, but it doesn't matter because they're keeping less species and are breeding less. This is reflected in their belief that breeding is the most important result, and it is the only variable in which to measure the success of the invisible arc. But what about the success of the naturalistic enclosure? The authors state that it offers no or little practical benefit to the breeding of animals. They are created strictly for the public. Most species do better in cages than exhibits. If ease of maintenance, reduced injury and longevity of captives are of any measure of welfare. To me this is just showcasing another lack of animal welfare understanding. The authors are expressing extreme utilitarian views that I believe are very one dimensional and black and white. Now throughout the book there is a lack of understanding of animal welfare science and constant branding of changes or progression in zoos as the buckling under antis. This book has entire sections dedicated to describing animal rights and how flawed their extremist beliefs are and how they stop the good work of the Invisible Ark. And while yes they do make some good points throughout the book, to me it's abundantly apparent that everything expressed within this book is just as extremist as the opposition they are opposing just at the opposite end of the spectrum. This is something that is really noticeable in so many areas. The extremists at the opposing end of the spectrum are at each other's throats or simultaneously branding those of us in the middle as the opposition because we don't align with their black and white viewpoints and with those with balanced views being branded as the enemy and are in line with animal rights extremists. Personally I fundamentally oppose the deontological viewpoint that keeping animals in captivity is not justifiable, but I also fundamentally oppose keeping animals with a complete disregard for animal welfare. Reptiles and research can and does get branded as the opposition of the spectrum by both ends of the spectrum. I would place myself and what I put out on reptiles and research as right down the middle. Where would you as a viewer and a keeper place yourself? Leave a comment with where you feel that you are on the spectrum using the comment template I've left in the pinned comment on this video. I think that would be really interesting to see where we all are. You may feel this video has left you feeling conflicted, but that feeling of confliction is good. It shows you're thinking of things on a more critical level. Exercising deeper thought like this could be considered the hallmark of a good responsible keeper. And to continue this type of deeper thinking, you need to watch this video right here.